I'll come. The first um, lecture would be Osman Coelho Jr., who is our uh, contract management director. Thank you. Samir is very tall, and the microphone is. Well, uh, good morning to all of you. It's a privilege to be here talking or lecturing to you or mentioned to be in the presence of our minister, Bento, of our president, of our directors. I'm not going to cite everyone. But it's a pleasure to have so many uh, known uh, friends here. Uh, we'll have a debate today, here today. One of them will be uh, a Canadian, Scott. So we're waiting for a uh, receiver for the translation, a translation receiver, so that he can listen to and take part in our debate, so that he cannot, he need not learn Portuguese immediately. Hi, Scott. Could you raise your hand if um, uh, you're hearing? Good. Wonderful. So I have a very small preservation uh, presentation to go through. Let's see the following slide. Let me see if I can uh, advance the slide. So this is a continuation of today's agenda. Now. We'll be ending our morning. Um, we had a small delay, but let's try to recover time last. In detail, this is the, uh, the, the p different pathways for uh, pre-salt offloading. We have three participants here. Unfortunately, uh, Qatar Energy uh, participant or representative could not be with us. So Fernando, who is Brazil CEO, was not able to be here with us today as well. I don't know if that's because of the uh, World Cup or the fact that he's Argentinian. But anyway, they had already let us know that he couldn't be here. But you three here will be, uh, will certainly make up for it. Thank you. So the first of them here is Eric. He's uh, NTS president, a new shipping company of the in the southeast. And they have available 2,000 kilometers of uh, of ducts of uh, of pathways to interconnecting the Rio de Janeiro uh, areas to the terminals, to the gas pipelines, Brazil, Bolivia, and to the unity and uh, to the unit that we have in the in Guanabara. And he'll be providing a presentation. We also have Marcelo Minicucci, He is a member of the consultancy uh, board at Gasbridge. Gasbridge is a Brazilian company, currently active in the value-added uh, natural gas chain. They have wonderful professionals in the area, and they propose to bring us solutions, technical solutions as well as financial solutions, to this market. And Scott, who's uh, off, uh, who's development, who's manager of. Uh, business and marketing at Enbridge, a Canadian company that works in distribution and shipping of gas. They they uh, ship 30% of the oil in the United States and 20% of the natural gas in the United States using a huge network, especially in the Gulf. The company is based in Calgary and they're over with over 12,000 professionals as employees. So these are the uh, panelists that will be with us right now. We'll be talking about this uh, theme, which is gas. We've been uh, observing that gas is becoming ever more relevant and important. When I was yet a young, t when we worked in uh, uh, production and drilling many years ago, it was a problem. But after 30 or 40 years, gas is now a solution, has become a solution. It is the fuel. The transition fuel, it is also, uh, it also is very responsible for energy security. We can see the effects of it in the war right now in Europe. And we're very lucky to have, uh, and we've seen this morning in Jerk, our, our president uh, show us that a good part of the gas 
is associated to the increase in production in Brazil. And in 10 years here, we're likely, we will likely double our production of gas coming from the pre-salt fields. And pre-salt is responsible for a huge volume, is a huge volume of our total gas production. We should also consider in this process, we've also talked about, we're also seeing other discoveries. Ronan showed us a wonderful lecture. It is important that we consider that currently, especially in my opinion, Gas reinjection is already a standard procedure. We, there's no, we cannot uh, question the benefits that reinjection brings us, and we should uh, subtract it from this volume. But still, we still have a significant volume available for offloading, and we've taken this idea. Uh, even if the market is still a bit uncertain, we've considered this idea. We've taken this idea, and this is a. Uh, part of our institutional responsibility. We've talked about uh, send, uh, talking about this gas uh, to the consortiums. It is not economic right now because the volume of each project is a volume that may not justify the full investment that we need to invest in an offloading uh, network. So hearing uh, Samir speaking, we were, he talked not only about the unit, but he talked about the, he talked about the, the, the pool, the cooperation among companies, my gas, your gas. That could be enough to make feasible some kind of offloading that could be beneficial for all. So our idea today is to have these three midstream participants. We'd like to listen from them what are the solutions how are they implementable? And why is it that we have not yet still been able to implement them here in Brazil? Is it a cooperation problem? Is it a volume problem? Is it a problem of uh, economic uh, uh, strength or, or, or feasibility? But we're here, all of us. I can see the government, the industries, midstream, we're all together to try to find the solution. So the idea is that we can discuss, ask some questions. We're a bit tight on time, but it will certainly be a productive uh, discussion. So thank you. I'd like to first bring Eric for his um, lecture. Good afternoon, all of you. I'd like to thank uh, PPSA for the invite and President Jerk, Jerk. I'd like to thank him for his invite. Uh, Minister Bento, it's a pleasure to be here with you. This uh, subject of the gas, which is always a complex subject, both from the energy matrix uh, standpoint, as well as the one that, what is it that we want for us? What's the role of gas? But throughout my lecture, I'll be sp uh, speaking about the local reality. And we'll be talking about this at every moment. The local reality is critical. And that also means finding a balance, an economic balance. So first a disclaimer, I'm not gonna touch on the reinjection issue because reinjection re today is part of our solution. If it's part, uh, if, it, if, it, if it's acceptable cost-wise to the producer, it should be to us, so. Without further ado, just to present you a bit, uh, talk to you about NTS. Let's talk about the history of the natural gas. We'll talk and and we'll focus again on the local reality. What is the European doing? What has the uh, American done? If you if you consider your local realities, you have a chance of of having an optimum planning. If you don't. If you don't look at your own local reality, uh, you can look elsewhere and see that it's not maybe appropriate to your own con uh, country. Let's talk about the gas hub, Rio de Janeiro, the NTS strategic guidelines. Uh, it has worked with its guidelines looking at the roots. So we had this in-house. So what are we going to do strategically is talking. We're in mix and we have to unite the, the tips. We went after what was happening at sea. And I'm very happy when we see all the presentation that anticipated me that are exactly uh, in a 
agreement with our strategies. New offers the uh, role of new strings and logistic uh, solutions. And there are next steps, optimizations. It has to do with what Small spoke. And what do we do now? What is going to be the coordination? How are we going to work from now on? And, and as today is an advertising now for you, we're going to do together with Vision next year. And as today, we we're going to show all our portfolio, our products, our projects for the market to take advantage of the best way of the logistics solution NTS is offering for you. So our shareholders, w w their funds, we are controlled by Blue Fruits an Operating Fund. What is an operator fund? It's an investment fund. Our shareholders operate the assets that they have participation in. So NTS has uh, tried since the beginning operate their own assets after the acquisition held with Petrobras. Our funds add two trillion dollars, two trillions. You're accustomed to high numbers and we also in Brazil. Only Brookfields have $100 billion and we're here for more than 120 years. So our funds are always interested in investing in South America and we have assets everywhere in the world. And as I mentioned, which is the vocation of the funds to operate. NTS has went through three stages, and it's very important also because the, la the framework of acquisition of our shareholders involved a company that, uh, in fact, didn't have a staff. It was only paper operated by Transpetro, and we evolved this paper operated by Transpetro. And what are we today? We're a company that operates, and we think about the future. And we have already invested more than 450 million reais in improvement of their assets up to now. So we started operating as of June of last year. And we already have a, a good track record of operation, one year of operation. And we're going into the operation. And our shareholders challenges us. From now on, what are we going to do? Which is the, the vocation for NTS? It's interesting to mention also, besides that, to talk about the tangible vocation, comparing to planning, who is the worst and who is the best, the, the European or the American one? Of course not. Both countries, both places have a very integrated grid that is very important, a very, very dense grid, uh, integrated and competent. But in uh, Europe, you don't have the sources, and Europe had to have decision making and disconnect from Russia. They had, they bet very, very strongly, but um, uh, I don't know if it's correct or not. But uh, instead of the nuclear ones, uh, many German people are not happy about, they haven't disconnected the nuclear production. They bet 40% of the European market coming from Russia. And what happened today? Nowadays, we have a war, literally a war, but it's a war that has a great uh, strength in the integration of the countries. So the European grade, integrated one, they have stock, they have important hubs like the Belgium hub, the Zeebrugge hub, that is a hub that is literally uh, having all the supply when you don't have any supply coming from Russia. And the German one, it's also integrated and it's strong. It's also very dense. However, it has a full production. That's a local reality. So what do they do? They export. So which is the secret? The great lesson learned when you compare both cases. Who has don't import? Who has uh, developed an export? Those who don't have, they have to find a way and they diversify. Perhaps the great uh, mistake between quotation marks was the lack of sources. 40% came from a single source. It's complicated. We went through this in Brazil. Let's talk about this further on. This was very strong and participated in, in the project from the beginning, but there was a doubt. Will we depend on them? No. So this discussion has to be connected to the local reality. We didn't have the pre-solved when we put Bolivia Brazil. We didn't have a reality we have nowadays. And everything that was shown today up to now here in this seminar in terms of oil production, gas production, 
is how we developed all this. So a development that, in fact, is this reality here in this graphic you can still discreet. Everything that we have nowadays regarding gas in Brazil is due to the Bolivian source and a stable one called Michelin. This is very important to understand. All the development we have nowadays, fantastic development we have in the state of Sao Paulo, for example, fantastic one, came from a conga, a very small one, to a, con a great conga in the state of Sao Paulo, plus two concession areas. All the development in the south of Brazil is incredible also. The, 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 the industry was transformed in uh, export ceramics thanks to natural gas. This happened because there was no consumption of natural gas in the south of Brazil, and there was the building of the pipeline Bolivia Brazil with a south leg that took gas there. I was CEO of TBG for two years. When I went to the south was, when will TBG expand? That was the question. This was due to two great sources, Bolivia and Michelin. And obviously, the associated gas that comes from Gabion is complementing all this. This solution held very strongly our market, industry, homes, and vehicles. This solution was a very competent one for these two last decades. When I mentioned that we had gas, we're talking about a stable and constant source. To develop the industry, we need this. So what is the generic like, one in this? It started with our local reality, thermal, electric, non-constant space. This made us to have the option of GNL, is MD of gas. It's a country house that you go twice a year, and which is the best solution to be. Ask your wife, they start enjoying the country house because they go, let's say, 30 times a year, you start thinking about buying gas, because our wife and ONS didn't enjoy it a lot, the country house. So what do we do? We buy it spot. And this solution is a solution that Brazil adopted during the last two decades. The question that we ask is, everything that you have seen here today, and we've been talking with the producers through PPSA, IBP, Petrobras, Shell, Galpi, and all total also that we're chatting along, how is this curve going to be from now on? That's a great question. How do we fit the curve that you have seen today during our seminar with this curve here in order for us to maintain the status quo or change the status quo? That's the question. What do we want? Do we want to invest in GNL in the firm's market? Do you want to depend more on Bolivia? Do you want to depend more on GNL? Or we don't want any one. And we want to continue maintaining the status quo of gas for a strong market. So then, a sad thing comes with hydrocarbons. They end. The problem is that you don't find them in the same place when you created the infrastructure. That's the problem with the hydrocarbons and also all the other minerals. That's what we're doing nowadays. The logistic solution of GS looks for new sources in which the best logistical allocation for us not lose this status quo because the status quo that's here is the one everybody dreams about. A firm, a stable a market and gas, or flexible one, market and gas, in order to increase the amount of terminals, to increase also the stock, and depend on someone or some agent, some trader, or some situation where in case we have a war, which is not very common, you will be with a lot of problems. So, considering the local reality, and I will pass very briefly because everybody knows very well this. We started to see exactly this condition. What is going to happen in a, a offer and demand in Brazil the next 10 years when the natural drop of Bolivia comes? And disclaimer now, when I say the source will not zero, the source will go to a number or will start to dropping 
in a level that is not a level that will sustain itself. It won't develop itself. That's a problem. So we're starting to notice that Bolivia during this period of time was, and Michigan during a period of time, we're starting to notice also what is coming. A lot of gas is coming. You've seen this today. And how does it come? And when does it come? That's the balance of offer and demand in a period of time. And we adopted this in NGS to first. Let's maintain the status quo. Oh, that is. The client is accustomed to a, a strong source. Is that it? We think it's reasonable. So let's reallocate the gas that is replacing naturally the Bolivian Michelin to first to the mature markets that exist and that have to be supplied. That means the optimal allocation. Then we start considering the gas pipelines to develop the market. That is, if you do the opposite, you have a serious risk. And here you know very well the geography. Everybody knows it. That you have a uh, uh, round five going without a logistic solution to replace Bolivia in some place, some place in Sao Paulo, the south of Brazil, at the same time, try to monetize this gas with a gas pipeline, yeah, and Sao Paulo will be consuming GNL, or increasing external dependency, and you will see. Look, uh, we are re-injected more than we need require, monetize Route 5, develop a uh, market, and at the same time, Sao Paulo consuming GNL. In order to avoid this, we as the ministry, we are offering a pool, an optimized pool, where you receive gas and you leave uh, departures of gas, obviously. We have a gas market appearing, and this market already exists. It doesn't have to be developed. It has to be replaced. Therefore, obviously, this has to do with the curves that we've discussed already today. We have the guidelines here. It's a free salt gas is the first one. We're here to give solutions to the free salt gas. The solution is in your pocket. You're here to retain a track thermal electric demand. If the thermal electric are out of our grid, it's because of some economical problem. And we have to find a solution to this. So we're working with products together with the financial market in order for this thermal electrical to be connected to us and to the capability of competing with the famous the island thermal electric. And they incentivate them to continue being with us. Because at the end, the electrical sector is very mature. It's integrated in all the sources are integrated to it. There's no way of someone integrating a source in the electrical. Why not the gas sector to work likewise? The other one involved the pipeline to stock Janelle. You're going to stock it? No, I don't want to. I want to optimize Janelle. It makes sense to replace vessels for onshore stocks, and we're going to start considering this mainly in Rio de Janeiro. Onshore on unit with certification, where we already have this kind of units in the United States and Canada, operated by our shareholder, and bring here as a solution, and uh, re repeating some of a Belgian who has offshore gas unit, the ones that have onshore gas unit have everything. Look what's happening in Europe and GNL vessels in our flexible terminals. Everybody is going to Europe because they're paying more. The opportunity is more than $90,000 daily rate of a vessel. If you have a unit, you're able to have a hub to give a difference in the price and also to uh, offer something very important, speech. Uh, island terminal electric, or, or the one that's connected to us, has a delay in the dispatch. So this kind of solution, we're able to reduce the delay 40, 50, 60 percent, giving speed to the dispatch of the terminal electric. Another product is a small scale market, a virtual pipelines that will be able to develop markets. And obviously, then we will go with the further gas pipelines and then uh, lower the emissions 
but this has to do with a local reality. What we have to do nowadays is to minimize the chain and decrease uh, greenhouse gases, and then we will give a further step. We're talking about hydrogen, yes, of course, but we have to dedicate uh, uh, homework to do. Look how much gas we have to reallocate and optimize the reallocation of the gas. Well, uh, being very brief, our project is divided into two parts. Number one is compression <coughs> Japanese station that is called <coughs> bottleneck number one. This station is fundamental today to have NTS to have the same delivery capacity that we have in Hiplon, considering the gas is coming to Rio de Janeiro. More and more is coming from the optimum point that is being injected in Sao Paulo. For us to have the same capacity of delivery in Hiplon, we have to have a compression sta station. Bottleneck number two is uh, reinforcing the grid, literally speaking, in Campinas Hill, associated to, to four compression stations, and this will be adapted once between route five and three and four A or B, and the discoveries that will be near Michelin. So once everything happens, this G bottleneck two will grow or will decrease. But with this, with all the projects in hands, and with a follow-up, which is happening mainly 23 and 24, we will be able to adapt to NP, to upstream. We are also working with a stocking plant, uh, stocking about 180,000 cubic meters of GNL. And this is a plant in Portugal, a very similar one to the ones that we want to bring here in the north of the state of Rio de Janeiro. And lastly, which are the next steps? To optimize the resources. Everybody's doing this. The professor gave a, a very great class today, wonderful class regarding Brazilian geology. Everybody is uh, looking for a dependency. Why don't we uh, find a, a independence, of, uh, independence of gas and optimization of energetic uh, planning and long term? We're linking the distributor planning. We have Ignacio Glasnigi, Congaj, the, the problem of the producer, and the midstream, everybody together. But as we are midstream, we're enabled to meet all of us and allow the optimization. Int effective integration of electrical gas is in the stock. The lost link is a stock. The lost link, due to 20 years with the stock, will be enabled to meet this. Ensure the integration of the supply sources. This is very important. The struggle that we're facing here in Brazil, and I'm uh, talking about uh, in the name of our shareholder, has 800 billion of dollars of assets in the world. There's no network that has a disintegrated source. Just to give you a small example, in June, Bolivar cut off 6 million cubic meters of gas from Brazil. And we had a situation because, unfortunately, Michelin was uh, with a downtime that we couldn't revert. So during one week, in coordinated with our customers, we brought two cargos from Bahia de Guanabara to Rio de Janeiro, and we saved Sao Paulo during one week, a whole week. Why? because Sao Paulo was connected with us, and by Guanabara in the terminal was connected with us also. So imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if Bayou Guanabara wasn't interconnected to our grid, what would happen? So obviously, all the sources have to be interconnected. This is obvious. This is an issue of principles. The electrical sector, we don't even mention disconnected sources, but here in Brazil, in gas, we hear this. And this is a struggle that I request your help here, the producers helping us to be together with us as we were in the issues of the Law Gas Act that was so successful. And this is uh, the process. We have the, the offer capacity, and we suggest you put the, in the Google and search for this. It was developed in GVG, and it's the Amazon of gas. What is it? It's literally Amazon. You want to buy a molecule, you go into the pocket, the pocket will check it. Where you have a molecule, where you don't have molecules, then you have a logistic uh, link between the consumer and the seller. 
the pocket is a reality. It works for NGS and TBG and target, and we three are part of the pocket, and we are having a great effort with AMP for pocket to replace the ten public tenders. Uh, we've ma heard about continuous auctions, 24 hours per day, 365 days per year. This idea of pocket are uh, not allowed to uh, public tenders to allow producers to disconnect from the consumers. The pocket is a reality. Of course, it's going to be offered within an auditable system. That's what we're doing, seeing with ANP. And if everything is okay the next quarter, we won't have public tenders. I'm sorry if I extended myself. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you've actually answered some questions that I had um, written down, but it was very interesting to know more in depth, uh, especially this vision of assuring what we already have at hand. I'd like to continue. Let me call Marcelo to speak uh, briefly about uh, his working proposal that we have, uh, his proposal at Gasbridge. Let me see how this works out. All right. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Thank you for the invite. My work or my challenge to uh, build a 10 minute presentation was, uh, was uh, highly facilitated, uh, made easier by those who followed uh, before. We've heard a lot about uh, this subject today. This project that we've been working, one of the project, one of the gas bridges projects talks about the gathering of the gas up from offshore fields. We're speaking mostly here of the pre-salt fields. As again, I'd like to uh, second Eric on the importance of integrating these systems. It is something that is uh, important for what we're doing and also about storing uh, natural gas. We, uh, we see the storage of natural gas as a critical need in Brazil's uh, natural gas markets or businesses. We are seeking to store natural gas in depleted reservoirs or uh, other reservoirs. But this is something different from what I'll be speaking about here. But this is just certainly uh, mainly to agree with uh, what has been said before. What is this flagship project that we call? What what do we intend by this? It's a multi-client system, and this, uh, and uh, echoing what uh, Osman mentioned beforehand, not all of the fields uh, uh, have the ability of anchoring a gas pipeline from A to B as we're accustomed to. So this cooperation, this uh, this is uh, the, the joining together these different production profiles is something. It's the projection profile, it's the size of the field, the plateau, the size of the field. All of this is critically important in optimizing infrastructure. Why is it that we believe that there's a, that there's space for this, there's a possibility for this? We've talked about the substantial gas, natural gas reserves. Again, following, uh, uh, secondly, what Eric just said, we're not going to be speaking about the injection or the re-injection. We do recognize that there's much space if it's economical or not to re-inject gas. If it is, continue with it. If not, let's try to offload this gas somehow. Another huge challenge that we have in the pre salt gas is, is that there's a water uh, depth and distance from the, uh, from the uh, coast. Today we see gas pipelines. Today the gas, is, the gas pipelines are very expensive, not because of the pipeline costs, but the, the cost of launching, of installing, implementing that. Everything is very expensive to be able to ha have these gas pipelines installed at the depths that we need in the pre-salt. And, and obviously the scarcity of this ability it translates into higher cost. Another point, the, the most important issue may be that the natural gas market, yes, it is opening up, it is evolving, but today, 
speaking with the producers, what we hear, obviously I'm paraphrasing others, people don't use these exact words, but they ask me, why is it that I'm going to invest $2 billion in a gas pipeline to transfer a problem that I have right now in the seabed, in offshore, to the coastline? The truth is that the associated gas producer needs a consumer for the gas that he has and only, only and for the gas and only for the gas that he has that's a perfect world how can we actually <coughs> uh, solve these problems well storage is important but we need anchors these gas pipelines will not come into being without anchors and we've learned in regulation that uh, the electrical electrical sector is not this uh, stable anchor or this underpinning that the gas producer needs so what's the solution that we have been studying and we have been advocating for this is a an exaggerated simplification but we want to create hubs these hubs will will be one of these um, uh, this will be one of the gas pipelines that the hubs will anchor so we'll have uh, these hubs that would have uh, receiving points to receive from the different pre-salt fields that will be connected according to availability as they are producing natural gas it's a lot less expensive to over dimension gas pipelines in shallow waters and doing it in ultra deep waters so we do know that to double the diameter of a gas pipeline, we're multiplying the capacity by four. We do know this. Another thing that we need to address is uh, is to address a problem that is that is ignored, which are what's a liquid about the liquids of the natural gas. What do we do with these liquids? We do know that Brazil is infrastructure poor to dealing with natural gas liquids. So to come up to a gas producer and to say um, one that perhaps um, will moor 40 vessels or LNG carriers to take them up, that's not going to work. So what is important is to treat this gas. The offshore treatment of this gas we see as an opportunity of creating a logistic operation that is less expensive, that does not exist, and using vessels for that. So the question always arises, are we going to export? Well, if you put it in a vessel, you can export it. You can export it to the northeast, to the south. And if we have these uh, local markets well supplied, we can export to the rest of the world. There's no problem in that. And the anchor, the underpinning that we need is transforming this natural gas into something that is closer to commodity. So we're talking here about floating LNG and floating methanol and other, there are a number of different uh, alternative sources. But let's talk about LNG, which is simpler. Again, this is important. We're not talking about floating LNG in the middle of the seas with three meter high waves, no. We're talking about this LNG, a floating LNG that is supposed to be like an, an anchor for a gas pipeline that's coming close to the coastline protected waters that allow for constant operation. This is a challenge that is completely, that is critical. We need reliability of the system. We know that these projects today are anchored. They're made possible by oil production. Maybe they may have 5%, 3% or 7% of the revenues would come from gas in these projects. But these five or 7% have the power of if it cannot be offloaded, it can stop production of the other 90-something percent of revenue. So no one uh, in his or her own right mind will, will depend, uh, will have this oil production depend on something that is not 100% reliable. Well, anyway, highly reliable at any rate. So the idea is to create these systems, such as this one, which will allow the growth scaled growth using this anchor, this underpinning that we consider to be critical. So following slide, please. So what have we done? A bit more than just a PowerPoint pre uh, uh, presentation. PowerPoint accepts everything. But we first did 
we conceptualized different production scenarios. Does Brazil really need systems for offloading gas? Or will we have enough gas for this? Yes, then we will talk about that. That needs to be answered by statistics, by analysis. We've had experts studying this. And we've been working with these people. And the response that we found is yes. We found, yes, there is space for new gas pipelines. There is a need for new gas pipelines. We've tested this concept with some EOCs, even with the Petrobras. There, so there are things that uh, we're looking at. We've identified what the uh, licensing challenges may be. That may be the biggest, uh, the most, there are many, but this may be one of the most complex questions in this process. Finding uh, uh, locales where the proximity of the markets and uh, licensing possibilities are feasible. We've looked at these considered. We looked at these ocean conditions. We tested. We we uh, contracted Genesis to testing these concepts. We des devised different uh, scenarios. Genesis uh, pumped in various of these or showed that many of these concepts uh, were not uh, feasible, at least using spreadsheets. We've confirmed some of these technical concepts. We analyzed who is our major competitors, the existing routes. So if I build something today and someone hits a button and doubles capacity of the existing pipelines or routes, then my project is dead on arrival. So we analyzed we looked at the restrictions, obviously considering the restriction of the information, we looked at the possibilities of increasing this network that we still believe will allow us to create more space for developing new infrastructure. We identified suppliers. I think someone mentioned that there's no one investing, no, no one investing non-existent spaceships. So all of the concepts that we work with are operational, even if not as we would like to, or or at least exactly as we want to implement here. But what we but we did an econ a preliminary economic evaluation, which shows that this concept is feasible. We basic we 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 looked at the question: Is this LNG to be produced here competitive worldwide? Yes, sure. There may be some cases where our gas may be more competitive, others were less. But the cases that we dealt with, that we considered, makes it feasible. Obviously, consider the unpredictabilities of some of the phases. So this is, uh, I end right here. And I'll, I'll leave. Thank you, Marcelo. It's nice to see you. Uh, concept with simple concepts that are combined that pass through an economical assessment that is not only uh, on paper. Thank you very much. So, our last uh, speaker is Scott, that is from Enbridge, and therefore he will not be able to speak in Portuguese, he will speak in English. You, let's say, follow. Scott. You have enough. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today and appreciate the uh, the invitation from PPSA. Uh, anybody who's ever visited Houston can understand that coming down to Rio de Janeiro represents quite a nice upgrade. So, uh, really appreciate the opportunity here. Let me see if I can move this for. All right, so a quick little legal disclaimer here for all the uh, the lawyers in the room. I'm going to skip right over that though, real quick. So who is Enbridge and why was Enbridge invited to come uh, down here to this conference today? So Enbridge is the leading North America energy infrastructure provider. Uh, our goal is to empower uh, businesses and empower society through our four main business units. Uh, we've got the liquids pipeline unit. We've got a gas distribution 
uh, utility unit, we have power, but the real reason that we were invited to come down here today was our gas transmission and midstream business unit. Uh, overall, we've got about 75,000 miles of pipe located uh, in North America. This ranges over a course of 30 different U.S. states, five Canadian provinces, but more importantly here for this conversation, it also includes the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Enbridge got into the Gulf of Mexico back in 2005 whenever it acquired a package of gas assets uh, from Shell Gas Transmission. And really since that time, Enbridge is trying to, been, trying to build out and develop this, this business unit uh, much further. In fact, over the last 10 years, uh, no company has installed more miles of pipe in the Gulf of Mexico than Enbridge has. Um, just a few statistics here for you. Uh, we own and operate uh, over 1,200 miles of pipe located in the Gulf of Mexico. We have 11 natural gas gathering systems, four crude oil pipelines. Uh, th those numbers are both going to be increasing uh, by one here, uh, hopefully at the end of this year. We've got uh, pipes on bottom for both a new crude oil pipeline and a natural gas pipeline as well. Uh, these will sh serve a uh, joint development by Shell and Equinor in the Gulf of Mexico. So hopefully later this year those will be increasing by one. Uh, additionally, we have ownership uh, in five uh, offshore junction platforms, four of which are manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, something that uh, we have in common with the pre-salt is about 99% of the gas that we transport in the Gulf of Mexico is all associated gas. Of course, gas associated with crude oil production. And what we've seen as the producers step out further and further offshore and get deeper and deeper, both in terms of water depth, but also in terms of the reservoir depth, is this associated gas is becoming extremely rich. Uh, lots of C5 plus components contained in the gas stream. And so as we transport that gas to, towards the shore, uh, you see a lot of retrograde condensate forming uh, in the pipeline as well. So not only are you having to handle the gas transportation, uh, you're having to handle the liquids as well. And so the places where we have assets coming ashore here, when you see dotted with the, uh, the red marks there, we've also invested heavily in liquid separation and liquid stabilization facilities so that we can uh, continue to deliver the gas to the downstream processing plants and then handle and remove the liquids contained in that gas stream as well. Um, like I said, liquid handling has become just about as important as the gas handling and the gas trans uh, transportation in the Gulf of Mexico um, over the years, and certainly we can expect that to continue. Uh, another thing that the Gulf of Mexico and Brazil has very much in common is who we do business with, and it's the folks sitting here in this room today. This is just a quick snapshot of the various companies that we do business with in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you can see here a number of them appear um, on multiple different systems, uh, but really we do business with uh, the largest IOCs, majors, um, all the way down to the more localized mom and pop type shops. Um, one of the staples of the offshore business and something that uh, I know I'm very proud about is just the amount of repeat business that we have from the customers that we do business with. I can think of one uh, major right now that we've been involved in seven of their last eight uh, new build pipelines for their new field developments. Uh, and so the, the amount of repeat business we get, not just for connecting them to our existing systems, but also to be trusted to develop and install and then own and operate uh, the new export pipelines is something that uh, speaks, I think, of volumes to the operation capabilities Inbridge has offshore, the project execution capabilities that we have offshore, and me being a commercial guy, the commercial capabilities that we have as well. Um, but I, I think really the, the main drivers behind that, the recipe that we have for success there is at the end of the day we get the job done right, which is getting it done safely, getting it done on time, on budget, and then when it comes to operations, we have safe, reliable operations. So this is just a quick little look, kind of in the next two slides will be a little bit of a before and after look. Uh, this is a typical deep water system that we have uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. This is our Cleopatra system, uh, which went into operations back in 2004. Uh, as you can see here, and I know it's kind of small to look at right here, but as you can see, we've got three different anchor developments which connect into this uh, single pipeline system. In total, like when this came online, there were seven different uh, shippers on this asset, and then it tied into 
into one of the junction platforms that I mentioned that Enbridge owns and operates. Uh, this is obviously designed for gas export, but it is capable of delivering gas back uh, to the production facilities for restarts. In the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot of hurricanes, a lot of turnarounds, and so this allows for the gas to go back to the producers to restart their operations so they can get back to the export uh, as soon as possible. This is what that exact same system looks like today. Uh, so as you can see here, we've added three different uh, developments onto this system. Uh, in total, that brings the, the shippers on this pipeline uh, up to about 17, I believe, um, serving these three different developments. And we're able to do this through the installation uh, at the outset of inline sleds. This is something that we work very closely with the producer community in regards to uh, trying to understand what their needs are, what their future plans are, where they see future development opportunities at. And we work with them and pre-install these inline sleds so that down the road we can make the connections in the most effective and most cost-effective way possible. All right, moving over to operations here, just briefly we'll touch on this, try to uh, claw back a little bit of time here. Um, our operations team uh, works very, very closely with the host operators, and really the operations can be summed up by saying communication and collaboration. Um, everything from uh, meter inspections and calibrations, pig launching, um, to line inspections and meter the host facilities. All of this is done with a lot of collaboration in order to minimize any sort of disruptions to the operations. We know at the end of the day, the whole goal is to make sure that the hydrocarbon gets out of the ground and moves to shore, and so we don't want to be involved in any sort of disruptions whatsoever. Uh, we do have real-time monitoring uh, on all the systems and all the inputs coming in, so gas volume, gas pressure, uh, the composition of the gas, so we know uh, exactly what's coming into the pipe and then what's exiting the pipe at all times as well. From a contracting standpoint, obviously there's a lot of different variables that go into uh, contracting for a uh, deep water development. Uh, these are just some of the ones that tend to pop up over and over and the ones that we've incorporated into our agreements through a lesson learned basis. Uh, one of the things I do want to touch on here uh, is just routine maintenance interruptions because um, I know that's a, a big concern about the, from the shipper community. Um, obviously we don't want to cause any unnecessary downtime to your operations and so what we do is we actually build in contractual commitments. So we're going to sit down with the shipper community uh, at, at least one year in advance, get an understanding of what their plans are, are they going to be scheduling any turnarounds, and then if we need any maintenance done ourselves, we'll do our work and our maintenance during that exact same window so that we can, like I said, uh, avoid any unnecessary downtime to either of our operations. So this is a little bit further on the, the expandability with the inline sleds. Um, Again, we, we do this through a lot of collaboration and communication with the shippers early. Uh, we think that is key to developing a successful, uh, successful project. Um, we look to try to create solutions that not only serve the shipper community's needs uh, today, but also look to serve those same uh, shippers' needs in the future as well. So what does this all mean for Brazil? Uh, so we have a, a very capable technical team which has been doing a study uh, related to the pre-salt region. And as you can see here, we've identified a number of different options uh, related to gas evacuation coming from the pre-salt. We think a, a lot of the concepts that we've employed in the Gulf of Mexico to successfully grow that business over the last uh, decade and a half uh, could be used down here as well. We see a lot of similarities between uh, the pre-salt and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but what we need is we need you. We need the shipper community. Uh, we need the support. We need information from you. We've engaged with a lot of shippers uh, to date doing business down in Brazil. Um, we can always refine and further enhance this study as well. Currently, the study that we've worked on uh, addresses obviously pipeline evacuation routes, but it addresses gas processing, liquid logistics, connections to the downstream markets. Uh, but the inputs that we need from the shipper community to take this from uh, lines on a map and more towards a reality uh, would be information related to your first oil dates, information related to your flow composition, your flow rates, um, landing location preferences. This is the type of communication and collaboration that if we have that with the shipper community, then we think we can really develop something that could serve the pre-salt uh, for many, many years to come. So with that, that is all I have prepared. I certainly do appreciate the opportunity again uh, to come down here and speak with everybody today.
Muito obrigado, Scott. É, ótimo ver um, um modelo de alto de muito sucesso. Voltando ao Brasil. So now we're uh, running very low on time. Theoretically, we should have uh, ended the, this uh, this morning's events at 12:30. So and it's almost 1 1 p.m. So we won't have much time available for questions. So Maria Luisa tells me that we would have time for one question. So I am going to be asking the question. And the question, I am going to ask this question. One, oh, one sole question to all three of you, trying to summarize everything that we seek with these uh, presentations and these discussions. In your vision, what still prevents us from evolving with these models, with these improvements, with these investments, and even more, what is it that we can do from our end in government, industry, in terms of exploration and production and consortiums, what can we do to help in this evolution? Can I start with you, Eric? Wonderful question. The technical, the technical uh, issue We've solved. We already have it. We've mapped pretty much all of the possibilities that we could have on in the in our coastline and the optimum location of the gas. So we're prepared. Uh, we have bottleneck one, bottleneck two, and we're also uh, prepared in terms of LNG storage. We've talked to all of the other um, agents. What are the following steps? The next steps. First, we need to coordinate. With the uh, M with the Ministry of Mines and Energy, now we're going to have the big uh, that that's going to come out with bottleneck one and two. What we need now is uh, as an look to comparing with our legal milestone that we've come that we've uh, achieved here. After the legal milestone, we built a uh, a monitoring desk for the legal milestone. And they've asked me, do you need another legal milestone? No, now we need to monitor and follow up and implement these projects. Why? So that tomorrow, or in five or 10 years, uh, someone says, well, Bolivia no longer has, now I'm using more LNG in Sao Paulo than I need. Wow, Route, F Route 5 has no uh, gas storage available. So. Before, we need to propose to the producer, listen, I have a pre-salt corridor here. I have an opportunity to uh, replace a product and have that graph that I just showed you that we can increase uh, uh, flow rates, but we'll keep the status quo. If we have, uh, those who have industries, they are not going to do without what they already have. So this, uh, desk that we assembled for monitoring the uh, the milestone we have to recreate it and have the log the logic what is the role of gas in brazilian energy matrix for the following 10 years that's first thing second thing is what are the projects that will be implemented to allow us to have a equilibrium stable equilibrium between demand and supply so that afterwards we can develop new markets First of all, it's coordination. But the same coordination that we had that was very successful when we implemented the, the legislation, the gas legislation. Um, mine's going to be a little bit of a two-part, uh, I guess, response to that question here. The first would be uh, ensuring that there's equivalence. Uh, from a taxation and cost recovery standpoint, as long as there is a perceived benefit uh, for maybe a uh, producer-owned solution versus a third-party like Enbridge-owned solution, if there's a benefit one way or the other, then that's always going to be the answer, the, the, the way that the producer community goes. So as long as we can uh, achieve equivalence with either a third-party-owned solution or producer-owned solution, uh, then I think then there's an opportunity there to develop the offshore and the pre-salt for a, uh, a new route to shore. Uh, the second is, is also just a kind of a mind shift uh, paradigm from the producer community about the, the control of your own destiny uh, type of philosophy. We saw that a lot uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and it took many, many years to overcome that uh, and such that we've worked with the producer community to get them comfortable to understand that 
Uh, a company like Enbridge is capable of, of not holding up your multi-billion dollar developments with the pipeline piece. I think we can all recognize that would be a very, very bad day for everybody if the upstream development's ready for service and the pipeline is not. Uh, and so we've worked with the producer community to, um, to, to kind of ease that fear. Um, in fact, typically we have our pipe on bottom at least 12 months in advance of first oil, just so we can make sure that we're gone and clear and we're not going to be holding up any of the development. Desenvolvimento do produtor. Essa é a questão. Eu não posso deixar de. I have to repeat what Scott had mentioned a very fundamental issue. Our regulating framework is not prepared for independent midstream mainly in the issues of cost recovery in the case of result and also in the case of taxes. So it's extremely complicated. We have to understand this. And likewise, I think this al commercial alignment between different, among different partners in order to create this reliability in operation that they will be uh, holding their oil production in an infrastructure operated by third parties. In fact, it has to be very well considered. And this only is built with time. We will have surprises, but I think we must start to work in this. Excellent. Well, we've reached the end of our incredibly productive chat. Uh, we delayed a little bit, Maria Luisa, but I have to show my appreciation to our speakers. They were wonderful. They brought a lot of modern insights, something that we can really consider in order to reach what we want, what we heard here, uh, cooperation and reliability. And these are things that we Brazilians are accustomed to work like this. So uh, apparently we've done a lot in the past, we have a lot to do in the future, but the path is this, it's given, and little by little we will reach this and we'll take advantage of everything that we've heard this about this today in the piece of which thank you very much. Let's clap our hands for everybody. <laughs> and pass the floor to Maria Luisa, thank you very much to all of you. Okay, today we will still have a technical table in the afternoon uh, for some guests. Uh, the debate will be prevention and the struggle against the fluid circulation of the pre salt. Uh, the action is a result of the technical committee of PPSA. This event will continue this afternoon, but now in the morning we're Ending, and uh, thank you very much to the speakers, you here also, all the audience, and to the moderators also of our panel. Thank you very much. Until next year. Thank you.